Hey, Celebration people, and for everybody that possibly will have an opportunity to watch this video, this is something that I wanted to do for a season, and it's something now we're kind of fleshing out and having an opportunity to have a conversation. And so we are three men who are all part of the church here at Celebration, and I have the privilege of getting to lead this church as a senior pastor. But let me introduce my friends to you. This is Corey Martin. And Corey Martin's been in Fairhope for um, seven years, I believe, maybe eight. Seven, eight years. And Corey, where are you from originally? I'm from Mobile, Alabama. And I'm not going to get him to share his middle name. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is it's, it's our friend. Introduce yourself. I know his name, but I'm going to let him do it. I'm Emmanuel Seals. And he's not going to talk about his middle name either. And neither am I. And Emmanuel, you guys are bit, you're from Fairhope. You grew up in Fairhope. Right. I was born and raised, uh, moved away for 11 to 12 years and came on back about eight years ago or so, nine years ago. All similar, pretty much similar in age. All of us are married with children and raising our families, trying to be biblical men in a society and to go counter culture. And there are things that kind of scream to us, some things that need to be addressed from a kingdom mindset instead of just a cultural mindset because kingdom principles will always supersede, supersede cultural context in the sense of there is right and there is wrong. And Corey and I were on a mission trip. It's been probably four years ago. We were in uh, Victoria Falls, Zimbabwe together. And I told Corey then, I said, Corey, I think that there are elements and things that we could speak to uh, uh, and, and really kind of make a difference with. And we talked about it all the way back then. We even agreed. We're like, yeah, this would be good. And we just kind of never really just sat down and made it happen. And one of the reasons I think I never made it happen, because I never wanted to ever just do it in a knee-jerk response to something, because you guys correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes when you do a knee-jerk response, it's almost like you're trying to uh, pretend that this is not who you really are. Right. And then I mean, some, yeah, sometimes yeah, exactly. people will, well, let me show everyone, and I will, because sometimes the loudest screaming voice isn't always the most convinced voice, right? That's correct. And this is us today just being who we really are. And... Now, hopefully, you get to understand our heart and kind of going forward and what we want, what would like to see happen. Two, three weeks from now, a lot of the noise that, that you're hearing is going to die down because there's going to be a lot of people that want to use a platform for what they never grieved for, what they were never really moved about. After they stop getting limelight, it's not going to be an issue anymore. But for us as leaders, as biblical men, we want to make a difference moving forward. And the only way that you make a difference is the way that you live every day. So we do have to address some kind of some elephants in the room, I guess, that a lot of people struggle with. And I can say, so I, Corey, I'll ask you, does racism still exist today? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, to act like it doesn't is just ignorance. And ignorance isn't bliss. Ignorance is a choice which leads to some very stupid decisions. Emmanuel, do you think that there are ways to really solve the issue with racism? There are ways. There are no quick ways. Yeah. It's a societal change that's going to take a long time and acceptance. And really what people need is truth Absolutely. to honestly look at themselves and look at society. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22 through 25, the beginning of that chapter talks about how We've been bought with a precious blood of Jesus Christ. And what I love about the, the, the heart of God is redeeming us as individuals, our spirit, our soul, and then us submitting our flesh. And our appetites are things we've learned and picked up, and our soul represents our mind, our will, our emotions. Our spirits have been redeemed, but in part of the sanctification process is us unpacking things that we've possibly picked up. And there are things that that I have to make daily decisions on how am I going to be a man of God. When you say there are no quick ways, I think back in the conversations that we've had previous to this recording, um, we can probably say that in the time that when we grew up as kids in school and high school, that seems, things seem to have gotten better, right, to some degree. To some degree. Um, it, you know, if you weren't um, um, entrenched um, in the... What's going on, um, especially if you weren't a black man, it would seem to be mm -hmm. getting better. Yeah. But in actuality, it was just not talked about. Yeah. But, it, it, but even back then, so there were things, were, things we, we dealt with at the high school that I went to where there was, there was some very racist things that, that happened that I, I'm pretty sure my kids have never really seen that because 
I think there have been some good changes that were made. And I think that probably the extreme racists now are kind of a lower tier. Now, and that may not be popular to say, but trying to, to, to be factual is it's not my job to defend racism. My job is to call racism out and say this is a kingdom issue, right? That's exactly right. This is not, this is not a, a black or white issue. This is a people issue. This is a heart issue, us against those that do not have that heart of God in them that choose racism. Right. Um, things have definitely gotten better. Well, my mom is from Fairhope, born and raised. And there was a time when she was a kid, she, you were in danger if you were black, if you were caught in downtown Fairhope, hmm. where after dark, that you, your life was in danger being downtown Fairhope after dark. And as a kid, we went to the pier all the time. Things have definitely gotten better. We went to the pier all the time. But there's another danger, she used to always say, sometimes she still says that things were, might have been safe then because you knew where you stood. The problem with um, racism, like Johnny was just saying, sometimes it's, it's low key. So you knew where you stood, you knew this. And as a black man, as a black person, sometimes you have to worry about things that other people may not have to worry about that you may think, maybe this is racist, maybe these people just don't like me because of this or that, or maybe they don't like me because of my race. If I have to worry about getting this job or worry about the police pulling me over, um, I didn't think I did anything wrong on the thing. Maybe I did. Maybe I forgot to use my blinker. Or maybe this officer just didn't like the way I look. And I'm a police officer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also the counselor here at the church, but I'm also a police officer. And while I've never seen that where I work or in our community, honestly, recent, uh, anytime, the, um, the idea of the fear that you have to have um, is kind of oppressing sometimes, mm -hmm. that you live in this constant fear of doing something wrong um, as we talk about the tragedy that's going on now that people are protesting. Um, it's, it's just, it can be difficult. And that's what I was talking about earlier about seeing truth and understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, that there's a truth to it. Uh, I'm not saying you go out and watch the video because it is a, mm -hmm. a hard video to watch. But if you do watch the video, there is truth right there in front of you uh, that you cannot deny. Yeah. Like I can't, I told, I share with both of them, I haven't watched the video because I can't handle watching the video because I don't want to see someone die. And then it, it, like I've shared with the church, like I've only seen the pastor of the Christ one time because I couldn't handle seeing my Lord beat that way. And that was just a fictitious, uh, um, it wasn't, it was based on truth, but it I wasn't, cried. it still maybe didn't even compare to how graphic it truly right. was. Like I, I, I was weeping so hard I couldn't breathe. That's right. I don't want to see it. Whenever the young man was shot in, in, in Georgia, I saw that. I'm on Arbery. I didn't want to see it. I, I was like, I'm, I didn't intentionally go watch that. It, coming through the feeds, like, oh, this just happens when it first broke news. It's like, oh, it's like, oh my gosh. It just, maybe I should have read the headlines. But I didn't go back and watch it over and over because seeing it one time was ingrained in my mind. Just any time I've seen something like that that was great from police officers, the videos that they use in training where police officer was maybe being too nice and somehow it get turned again. The guy grabbed a gun and like that's and you hear him screaming for his life. It 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 etches something. It's like I never want to see that, but but I know this. There was a man who lost his life at the hands of malice and hate and injustice. And I, my concern was doing a video in a time like this is if, if you say too much, you get criticized. If you, say, if you say too little, you get criticized. And I think if you're silent completely, you can be part of the problem. I think yeah. it's kind of what you referenced too. Right. Silence is, is not where we stand right now. Um, I think um, people that are, are, are not of the African-American race, the black race, um, that do have the power, the voice to stand with the people that are being oppressed right now. I think that's the greatest opportunity that you can have in your life right now is to speak out about these injustices and to be a part of the solution mm -hmm. and not continue to be a part of the problem. Talent, talent, it doesn't take talent to spot a problem. We know there's a problem, so we, we have to be part of the solution. And some of the ideas that we bounced around, you know, in, in talking previously, and you'll hear people talk all the time uh, and say, well, maybe we should do this. Maybe we should have joint church services, which I think is, is great. We can do that. That's not, that's not a problem whatsoever, but it still doesn't solve the longstanding problem. 
because we can come together for a service and have a blowout and it was all good, but then we're going to go back to our trenches of life as we know it and the things that make us comfortable. So here's, here's how we can be a part of leading change. Be willing to be uncomfortable. And how does, that, how does that happen? Go against the cultural norm of where you're at. Don't be a part of the solution. Don't be a part of the systemic culture to where it's like, oh, well, it's just different. I can tell you that right now on this stage, these guys are different than me, completely different from me. There's, there's something different about us. He's an Alabama fan. <laughs> Real time. <laughs> he don't even like football. <laughs> I'm an LSU fan. So you know it's the Lord that even allowed us to get together. But, you know, I, I was talking with Corey and Emmanuel too that part of what I struggle with in my personality is that whenever it's not an issue for me, I don't want to speak to it because I feel like I'm being lumped into and being accused of being something that I'm not. And so I struggle w- with that from, from time to time. Like I'm not going to speak to that because if I do, I'm giving, I'm giving more platform for something to be taken out of context. But we felt like this was probably an opportunity, not probably, is a good opportunity for us to show you that this isn't a relationship that were formed last week or two weeks ago. This has been, Emmanuel is part of the staff at our church. He works full-time as a police officer and he counsels in his schedule and schedules, uh, schedules people out. He's our, he's our church counselor. People come in for counseling, they book and they see Emmanuel. Whenever I hired you, uh, whenever we went through the process, you had opportunities to do other things and go other places. Uh, was there ever a time I asked you a question about your race? No, never. So the only question that was asked was one that you asked to me. And it was... Yeah, well, asked if you think it would be a problem... Um, being a majority white congregation where people not want to come see me mm-hmm. because I'm a black person. And I said, <laughs> if they have a problem, I, I can't remember if I said they need to leave or, or, or they need to let the Lord heal their heart or something like that. Right. So, uh, cause I can say, I can say things very just, cause it was never a thought for me because whenever I need counsel and when I, I never look at the color skin of a man and go, or an individual and go, well, I mean, they got, there, there are probably things, though, that I don't understand completely. And so Corey's kind of, in a lot of ways, educated me in some things. It's not that I, I didn't care. I just didn't have to know. And there are some things that he's interested in learning in history and context that, uh, apart from Scripture, that were just the basic things and how things have come to be. And, and I was like, man, that's, that's interesting. But I didn't feel a need when he was explaining to go, well, I just don't think that's true. No, it's because I, I don't think Corey's lying to me, <laughs> you know? Right. And so I don't have to be defensive because they're going to be a part of, of the solution. And, you know, uh, I didn't grow up when, when we were talking about the term white privilege. I don't consider myself to have grown up in a, in a very, you know, um, uh, affluent. Silver spoon, yeah, affluent. very fluent silver spoon. It handed everything, but yeah. I was blessed. But that's not the white privilege that's being talked about. And right. so I understand it this way, right? It's so a, basically, yeah, a lot of some people get offended when they hear the phrase white privilege. So they're thinking that they worked hard, they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, they weren't privileged, they didn't have this. Uh-huh. The, the white privilege that is inferred in this racial context is not that. You were born rich or were given everything. Uh, you may have a very hard life. But the thing is, you don't have to worry about the majority of people and police officers who are supposed to be protecting you or people just worried about them making misjudgments about you solely based on the color of your skin. And so even as early as 12, I had people crossing the street because they saw me walking down the street. Or locking the doors when you walk by the car. Right, or locking the doors when you walk yeah, by the car. Um, just based on the fact that my skin is a different color than theirs. You know? So that, that's the privilege of talking about. We're not talking about you were born and financially with a silver spoon in your mouth or you're rich or that. It's that you have the privilege of not having to worry about that. You may be judged by your financial issues. You may be judged by uh, what kind of clothes you wear or anything like that. But you're not judged by specifically just the color of your skin. What you were born with is something you cannot change. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what it means when they're saying white privilege. They're not saying you have more money or you were given these opportunities. They're just saying you are not 
uh, having bias and misjudgments about you because of this. But they're also speaking about, when you talk about white privilege, you're talking about the beginning of the United States. Not about, not about the Bible, but we're talking about just coming to America. Slaves came to America, they didn't have anything, and, it, and nothing was set up for them to have anything after they were released as slaves. So Emmanuel used the analogy, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There was a great leader once that said, how does a man pull himself up by his bootstraps mm -hmm. if he never had any boots? Mm -hmm. That's the privilege. That's the part yeah. that we're talking about. So even if there was a race and you put everybody on the line and you ask questions to these people, you said, if you didn't have this, take a step back. If mm -hmm. you didn't have this, you take a step back. If you didn't mm -hmm. have this, you take a step back. In the end, if it was black people on that line, those questions, the black people would be 100 meters back. Mm -hmm. They're in the race, but you got some people starting at the line and you got some people starting 100 meters back. That's the privilege that mm -hmm. we're speaking of. Yeah, I'm, and so I can say that that makes sense to me because so you, terminology can be a conflict. It's just right. knowing that, uh, and and there probably would be uh, as well. There there are times that I've rode and I've rode through different uh, different cities. It'd take my family through. I'm like, hey, lock the doors. But it had to do in the context of the high crime in the area that I was at. There would be probably some parts of cities that your family would travel where you would lock the doors. Not based on it's based on the the, the high crime in that area. You just want to be safe. So, but knowing that you're walking by at the grocery store, it's like, oh, here comes a black guy. Here comes, I mean, so you have to question. So if you miss it and you're watching, it's not, a, we're not trying, we're not sitting up here trying to be vulnerable so that we can be critiqued to death. It's saying, if there's anything in you that is, that, that is getting checked by the Holy Spirit, then ask the Lord to help you. Because we've got to, we cannot say that we are kingdom of God people and have hate in our heart for anybody based on the color of their skin or the social status of where they live or what they drive. That is just, it's not biblical. We can't do that. But what we can do is be a part of the solution is meaning that three weeks from now, we're still going to be hashing life out still figuring it out. And to do things with a, a shot of energy that you don't plan on continuing is only going to make it worse because it's going to prove to people that you really didn't mean it. I, I got something here. I, I just want to say, you know, um, you know, when we read, and Johnny and I have spoken about this, but when we talk about the church, I think Johnny, as the lead pastor, has done a great job of pulling all diversities into this mm -hmm. church. We have Asian Americans, mm -hmm. we have Latino Americans, mm -hmm. we have African Americans, we have Caucasian Americans. We have every, probably every color on the spectrum as far as nationality is concerned. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a great job of representing the Bible as well because the Bible speaks about this. You know, we say our prayers, we say the Lord's Prayer, we say, hallowed be thy name, our kingdom come, thy will be done you know, on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what does it look like in heaven? Well, if you go to Revelation 7, 9, Revelation 7, 9 said there's going to be a multi-ethnic, multinational, and they're going to be praising to God. That's not what most churches look like on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Multilingual. Go to Revelation 7, 9, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And I think I, I really respect Johnny because when I came here, you know, after leaving the South, Emmanuel, we were in the South. We left the South many years. When you go around, there are places that are not in the Deep South that are doing this. The mm -hmm. Deep South has, is way, I'm just going to say it. Mm -hmm. The Deep South is way behind black and white on integrating the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of the problem, yeah. you know. And I just want to put that out there, and I'm not scared to say it. It's a part of the problem, and, you know, it's okay to have you know, uh, all black churches. But I think in order for things to change, the churches, what's inside the walls of the churches and what's the church is doing outside the walls of the churches mm -hmm. has to change. Yeah, I was able to do it. So there's some ways that I can be a solution to problem as well it is now that I have knowledge of certain things, I can, to have knowledge and do nothing means that you're making a choice. I mean, what's the Bible say sin is to know what to do and to not do it? That is sin. So for me, if my heart is convicted in something and I see a need and I see a responsibility and I don't meet it, then I'm not being a leader. I'm being a follower of culture. And so we are called to set, we are thermostats, you know, not thermometers. You know, that's what we are called to be. We're supposed to set the temperature. And so 
this church, Celebration, and there are a lot of great churches on the Eastern Shore, but I don't pastor them, so I can't speak to the DNA of it. But if a church names the name of Jesus Christ, I can tell you this, that it ought to reflect what the community looks like. Because if not, you're just a social club that's just trying to do what you've always been comfortable doing. And the beauty of being willing to be uncomfortable is that it represents a lot of different backgrounds that make Sunday fun. I got to go preach a black gospel conference. And I've told this story a, a ton of times. You guys know as I've told it to you. I go in and they, they wanted a guy that was, that was a, a white preacher that had a little bit of fire. And so I always saw I had a lot of fire. And, and so again, I'm, I didn't grow up going to a black church. So I, I, but I was prepared to know that, it, that if the service started at 6.30, it was probably gonna be 8.30 before I got the mic. Because everybody, so, but I already knew that. And I'd already testified in, in, a, in a black church and got spanked with a hanky. So I was ready for some of those things while I was pre- so, uh, but So it goes on, this organ player is up there and like, man, he's on that Hammond B3. And he's, and I'm like, who? I mean, I'm sitting there like, just give me the mic. Just give me the mic. And he's playing behind everything, got the runs going. They introduce me. I get the mic. The dude goes sit down. <laughs> I was like, oh, and I couldn't say that, but that's what I felt like. Oh, okay. All right. You probably thought I was going to get up here and say, there's seven things that, uh, that you need to do to be free in the Lord. Number one, just ask him. Number two, do this. Now every head bow. I don't know what they thought I was going to talk about or promote a book. I had no idea. <laughs> so I was like, it's a little bit challenging for me. I had the mic and the mic was, it was, it was, it was the, the settings on the mic were anointed. So I, I just, I, I had a little kick to me and said, I just wish somebody would. And that dude came jumping up out the pews, jumped him, went back to his organ and he kickstarted me like a Harley. And I preached for an hour and 10 minutes on nothing, but we had fun. It was good. Now we did preach it was the Lord and it was a great, but those things are enjoyable, and I think it stretches us to not always do what is just comfortable, but we ought to represent, and I'll tell you what it does. It makes us mindful to say, I'm not willing to do something at the offense of my brother and my sister, too. There are some things I'm not going to like. There are some things I'm not going to post because it's not worth the misunderstanding, the offense of my brother or my sister. This past Sunday... I tried to, I, I battle, I, I, I never take time out of a service to just speak specifically to things because I always believe that, uh, that we're going to just keep the course and be consistent all the time. And, and I spoke to this issue and I felt like that I wanted to be understood by anyone that would watch in the community and of any color to know that this is just who we are. We genuinely love people and we have an opportunity. And these are, yes, parishioners in the church, also leader in the church and also leader in the community and serves on a finance committee team here at the church. And Emmanuel does all the counseling. This is, these are, this is, this is, you guys have been here eight years, eight, eight, yeah. eight plus years. You guys have been here seven years. Yeah. Corey and his family has always been here the whole time that I've been here. And so, uh, and there are many other families that I could, there are several other families that could pull up and, and different nationalities and different backgrounds, different colors of skin. But if I start doing that, it's going to, it's going to become fake at some point. Yeah. This is as genuine as we can be. And we probably could have done maybe a different time where there wasn't such a highlighted moment where it looks like we're trying to appease, but, we're, but this is not an appeasement. This is a call and a cry for us as a community and around the world to begin to say, I'm willing to become uncomfortable so that I can be a part of the solution and not the problem. We love everybody. We love white people, we love black people, we love teachers, we love police officers, we love lawyers, we love, uh, uh, I can't even name all of, uh, we love pastors, you know, we yeah. even love pastors too, it's crazy. All about, love. Um, All about love. I think one thing that uh, may stop some people, uh, we're not calling you to go out and go to a protest or anything like that. If you want to, good, go ahead and go. But if you just, things start in the home. So a lot of people are afraid to do Amen. stuff. Mm-hmm. So if, if you have a friend, uh, just ask them. You know, mm-hmm. if, if you're worried about offending somebody, ask your friend. Mm-hmm. And they, they can help you. They will let you know. It's like, hey, yeah, that's, that's a good thing to do. It's like, no, that could be perceived as racist or perceived as this or that. And um, pass it on to your family, to your, your kids. Yeah. Live your life. Just like you live a Christian life, you are Christ-like mm-hmm. to be a Christian. So incorporate that. This is Christ-like, yeah. to love your brother and sister, no matter what race or color or creed. This, this is what we're asking. Yeah. I look at, I'll say this as we, we wrap up. 
I think that the seed that we sow now may not harvest in the next several weeks, but I guarantee you it will harvest because it's a biblical principle. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. Uh, now a lot of people will play Martin Luther King clips, but they probably would not have back then. And a lot of what he spoke and that I listened to is, edu is educational. Even before any of these moments, I've always enjoyed the heart of what was, was behind. And so that was in some ways considered uh, protest. But that man sowed a lot of seed for a harvest he never got to enjoy. And things are a lot better now than they were then, but we still have work to do. Being part of the, the solution is being willing to be unpopular, but being willing to be honest. And the quote that you were talking about in the bootstraps was a Martin Luther King quote. Martin Luther King. So, I didn't, yeah, if you know that, you know that. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a lot of Martin Luther King things that Martin Luther King did that are even today coming to fruition. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem has not been solved. The problem hasn't been solved since um, slaves landed here in 1619. Um, and it, but it's time. It's been over 400 years now. And I think it's time for that to evolve, for that to change to where when a man looks at someone. But the only thing that's going to change that, guys, and I just want to make that clear, humans are going to be human mm -hmm. because we're carnal, okay? Um, it's going to take a heart change. I keep stressing yeah. that. And the heart change doesn't come easy. You got to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And the only way you ask for help is to have the Holy Spirit come into your life, ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. And then your heart will change. And you won't look at people with, uh, 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 um, with optics as far as uh, color vision. You will mm -hmm. look at them by the content of their character. Yeah. You will look at them by the content of their character because if you're not a good person, black or white, I'm not telling my daughter to date you. Yeah. You know, I don't care, you know, so, but if you have a good heart and you have good character, then black or white or Asian or Hispanic, you are a part of my body. And, mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and that's the way I wish that most of America on all sides, <laughs> it's not a political thing, it's a heart thing, yeah. um, would, would take this opportunity to, to look inside themselves and make mm -hmm. sure that's the way their heart is. I saw a quote and, and uh, referenced it, and I didn't share it because, you know, everyone's an expert on social media platforms to tear you down. And, uh, but it basically said this in a paraphrased version. If you want to know that you've made this, if you made an idol out of your politics, is if you think that this racism thing is a left versus right thing instead of a kingdom of God versus a kingdom of darkness. Right. And that's how you can know. And this isn't a Republican or a Democratic thing. This isn't a... This isn't a a, uh, a denominational thing. This is a, a soul that God has made, that he loves, that he gave his son for. Who would we ever be to mistreat what God has created as worthy? Amen. So it's a chance for us to make a difference. And I hope that you do. And we may do something like this you know, later down the road, but this was a chance for us to come together, our schedules worked out, and to say that we're not just praying for change. We're going to be a part of the change. And we may not be the loudest that you hear, but I'll tell you what you're going to see. Two years from now, we're still going to be doing it. Yeah. Three years from now, we're still going to be doing it. And we're not just going to do it on political years either when, the, when there's an election. It's going to be a part of our everyday life. This is because we have to embrace that and we have to teach our children. We have to prepare our children. And like, there may be some things that because our children haven't experienced it, like we may have been a part of or like you guys mistreated. I was never mistreated because of color my skin or anything like that growing up. But my kids could become to joke about something that could be a great offense because they don't even understand the cost of the hurt of the pain that was there. Right. And so I have to say, it's not, you don't joke that way because it can be misunderstood and offensive. You don't mean it that way. So once they're educated, they can't do it. They, they don't want to do it again, right? That's that should be the right. goal. And so if you tell me, Pastor John, when you said this, I mean, you understand how offensive that really sounds like, man, I had no idea. Cultural context, like in Spanish, I didn't know to madre was an extremely offensive term in, in Spanish culture. I was in Belize, and uh, there's a lot of Guatemalan influence there. And uh, I always say your mom to a ton of people. Well, well, that's probably one of the, like nobody wants to have the mom <laughs> talked about, right? So if someone says, those hey. fight words. Yeah, those are fight words. <laughs> a, bit, a bit like for, you know, for me growing up as a kid, if someone said my mom, like, hey, yeah. stop. But if they said something about my dog, it was on. You know, it's like, that was, that was Rocky. It was, he's my boy. You know, it's a little, a little twisted, right? But in some, like, you don't, do not talk about someone's mom. Well, 
Now, I understand in some cultures you don't say anything about anything's mom, but in this culture, saying to Madre, saying your mom, it was basically like cussing them out. I had no idea. So they were getting on there like, oh, good to see you in the best English they could. And I was like, to Madre, they're like, <laughs> I was like what did I say? Because I asked one of the Spanish guests, say, hey, how did I say your mom in Spanish? Like, to Madre, and they just smiled. They set me up for failure. Set me up for failure. So we're not, we don't want you to be set up for failure. That means that when you see, be a part of the solution, be a part of the solution. Let's don't make excuses for the injustice of other people. Let's don't try and defend. And let's also don't try and act like we understand everything that someone's going through either. Let's weep with those who weep and let's rejoice with those who rejoice and let's be biblical. All right, guys, anything? Anything else? You feel good about it? I'm thankful to be able to come together as men of God first and to say we're going to be a part of the solution. And hopefully this blesses you, but if not, that's okay too because it's something in conviction that as a leader that I wanted to do regardless of what the reception would be from people. God bless you guys.